we will we will get going. So today we're having given you this huge historical lead up. But I honestly don't think you can understand Islam without knowing how it's developed over time. So we're going to focus on the present today, and we're going to start off with Islam in practice. Like you know, what is it about to, to a modern Muslim? What are the main principles? What are the are the are the main um, practices? Uh, and it won't surprise you, I'm sure, to know that just like uh, Jews and indeed Christians, uh, Muslims quarrel quite a lot about what are the core beliefs of Islam. Uh, I'd say the, the, the sort of absolute basics they agree on. And then once you get away from the absolute basics, then, of course, there is a certain amount of um, argument and disagreement. So you can say three principles, I would say, are universally accepted in Islam, and they are the unity of God. There is only one God. Uh, God's revelation by means of prophets and scriptures, and God's final judgment of human beings for good or for bad. And interestingly, those are exactly the same principles that the medieval Jewish philosopher Yosef Albo came up with in Spain uh, in the 15th century. Uh, he proposed his list of three basic principles of Judaism, very much in opposition to Maimonides' list of 13 principles of Judaism. And obviously, Albo was saying, you don't need to make it so complicated. Um, there's, uh, there's, you know, there's, this is the three, and they are the same three. Um, the third one, of course, implying there is an afterlife, because you wouldn't be judged after you know, death, particularly, um, and if there wasn't an afterlife. So, yeah. So let's look at those one by one, and we'll look at some Quranic basis for each of them, because th these are very, very, um, very easy to find in the Quran. Wait a moment, let's see if I can share. Um, oh, ah, wait a minute, where are we? Oh, dear. There it is. Yes, I hope everyone can see that. Okay, so God's unity or Tawheed in Arabic, which is obviously related to the same root as Echad, Tawheed, Echad, it's got similarities. So here's the entirety of chapter 112 of the Quran. The, the last chapters are very, very short, uh, which is often recited as uh, part of prayer. And it says, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, say, he is God, the one and only, God, the eternal, absolute, he begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like him. So uncompromising monotheism, which I think we can, I hope we can all sign up to. And if we go on to, uh, oh, and I should just uh, point out here that uh, the word Allah is just Arabic for God. Uh, and if you talk to Arabic speaking Jews, they will also refer to God as Allah. It's not a particular private, um, you know, it's not only the Muslim God is called Allah or Allah is different from God. It's just literally Arabic meaning God. Uh, sometimes people think um, that it's something else altogether. Uh, so second principle, revelation through prophets and scriptures. And we looked at this verse of the Quran before, but it's worth looking at again. Say, we believe in God and in what was brought down to us and what was brought down to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes, that'll be the tribes of Israel, and what was given to Moses and Jesus and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We do not distinguish between any of them. We are submitters, Muslimun, to him, i.e. to God. So again, that's, uh, that's pretty general. You know, if, you, if you're a, a, a Jewish prophet or uh, Jesus can be understood as a prophet and Muhammad, of course, is seen as the seal of the prophets. And there are 25 prophets who are mentioned by name in the Quran. And they include most of the biblical ones and a couple who aren't known from anywhere else at all like Hud and Sali, who seem to be Arabian prophets. Um, but uh, basically, you know, if you're a prophet from, from the Jewish Christian tradition, you're a prophet in Islam. Uh, if we look at the final judgment, again, the Quran has a lot to say about the last judgment or the judgment after death, uh, much more actually than Tanakh does at all. And um, Islam understands that all creatures will be brought for a final judgment. And uh, terms for this include Yom Adin, which is exactly the same as Yom Hadin, the Day of Judgment, uh, Ayam al Akhir, Hayom Ha'acharon, the last day, and also Yom Al Hisab, which is Yom HaKeshbon, the Day of Reckoning. So those are all terms that are used for this. Only God knows when this is going to happen, but it will come suddenly. And there are quite a lot of graphic descriptions of it in the Quran. So we'll look at one from chapter 39 of the Quran. 
They do not assess the measure of God fully when the entire earth is in his grip on the day of resurrection, the heavens rolled up in his right hand. God be praised and transcendent beyond any association they make. And that refers to associating other powers with God. So this is against idolaters who don't believe in God or one God. And the trumpet will be blown and all in the heavens and on earth will faint except those whom God wills. Then it will blow, be blown a second time, and now they will be standing, waiting. And the earth will shine in the light of its Lord, and the book will be laid out, and the prophets and the witnesses will be brought forth, and true judgment will be made among them. They will not be wronged, and every soul will be recompensed for what it did, for God knows best what they do. And those who refuse to believe will be driven in crowds to hell. When they arrive, its gates will be opened, and its keepers will say to them, didn't your own messengers come to you and recite to you the signs of your Lord, warning you of meeting this day? They will say, yes, indeed. But the word of punishment for those who refuse to believe is just. It will be said, enter the gates of hell forever. How miserable the dwelling of those who think themselves great. But those who are pious to their Lord will be driven to the garden. This is Aljanna, which is, uh, or Janatul Aden, which is Gan Eden. Uh, they will be driven to the garden in crowds until when they reach it, its gates will be opened. Its keepers will say to them, peace be upon you. You have been good, so enter it forever. They will say, praise be to God who has fulfilled his promise and has bequeathed to us the earth to dwell in the garden wherever we desire. How wonderful the reward of workers. And you will see angels surrounding the throne, singing out praise of God, judged correctly. And it will be said, praise be to God, Lord of the worlds. So um, it doesn't seem just to refer to Muslims uh, because there's this sentence that says, didn't your own messengers come to you and recite the signs of your Lord? So uh, there are quite common Muslim understandings. That just means people who believe in God, whatever actual religion they belong to. Um, that's fine as long as you believe in God and his authority and that there will be a day of judgment and that there only is one God, you'll be okay. So it's not quite clear that this is a, a narrow definition of who will be saved at all. Uh, it, it's certainly interpreted often as a much, much wider understanding. Uh, and the, the Quran has a lot to say uh, both about the, uh, the heaven and the hell, um, but uh, that, that'll probably do for a sample here. So those are the three main principles that I think most Muslims would agree on. And then we have more principles that might be more arguable. Uh, Sunni tradition, based on mostly on hadith, on those later uh, um, transmit, orally transmitted traditions, uh, has more. So, for instance, the belief in angels and jinn, and the Quran often talks about angels. Uh, an angel is a malak, which is obviously close to malak. Uh, and in the garden, the original garden, the Garden of Eden, God created Adam and gave him a status that is in some way above the angels. And the angels are commanded to bow in front of Adam. But one angel called Iblis refuses to bow down to Adam and is therefore thrown out from the garden. And he becomes a force of evil with a host of evil followers who are called the Shagatin, so they are the Satans. And again, uh, Shaitan is an Arabic form of Satan, meaning the adversary or the, the devil. Uh, it's not quite sure where the name Iblis comes from. Some people think it comes from the Greek diabolos, which is, means devil. The English word devil comes from diabolos as well, as in diabolical, for instance. That may be where Iblis comes from. Uh, there's a root in Arabic, uh, sort of the equivalent of bet lamid samach in Hebrew, uh, which means to be in grief or to despair. So some people think it comes from there. But Iblis or the devil, uh, shaitan, becomes quite a character. And here is a story about this uh, being cast out of heaven uh, episode, uh, very like the Lucifer story that's based uh, on traditions in the Tanakh and then elaborated in both Jewish and Christian thought. Uh, here, by the way, the we is God speaking in the royal plural. It is we who created you and gave you shape. Then we bade the angels bow down to Adam and they bowed down. Not so Iblis. He refused to be of those who bow down. God said, what prevented you from bowing down when I commanded you? He said, I am better than he, I'm better than Adam. You created me from fire and him from clay. God said, get down from this. It is not for you to be arrogant here. Get out, for you are of the meanest of creatures. He said, 
give me respite till the day they are right raised up, I till judgment day. God said, be among those who have respite. He said, because you have thrown me out of the way, lo, I will lie in wait for them on your straight way. Then will I assault them from behind, from before them and behind them, from their right and their left. Nor will you find in most of them gratitude for your mercies. God said, get out from this disgraced and expelled. If any of them follow you, hell will I fill with you all. So it's a very vivid and uh, dramatic portrayal of God's casting out of this uh, formerly angelic being who then becomes a force for evil. And uh, yeah, I would say a lot of, uh, that's, that's quite my, mainstream, maybe not as mainstream as the first three principles, but a lot of people are quite happy with that. Um, other angels are mentioned by name in the Quran, notably Jibril, who is Gabriel, Gabriel, and Mikal, who is Michael, or Michael. So they actually are named them. Uh, an Islamic tradition understands angels as being created from light, except for Iblis, who is created from fire, which is presumably why he's a you know, bad angel and superior bad angel. Another uh, supernatural creature that's mentioned in the Quran um, is the, the, the jinn. The singular is a jinni, which is the origin of the words genie, as in the genie and the lamp in English. And the jinn are a sort of lower grade spirit. They can take possession of people. And in the pre-Islamic period, they were thought to possess poets. And Muhammad was actually accused of uh, being possessed by a jinn in, his, uh, in, in the Quran in his early days. That was one of their arguments against him. And the jinn are often thought to have been created from smokeless fire. Uh, they are dangerous troublemakers, but they're less powerful than the shayateen, the satans. And they have limited lifespans and they are judged by God in the great judgment like humans. So there can be good jinn and bad jinn. It depends you know, where they are. And they appear enormously in um, is Islamic folklore and stories, as I'm sure you know, things like the Arabian Nights. Uh, another very common uh, principle is the belief in predestination and the divine decree. And this is a question that's universal to all religions. Uh, do humans have free will? Or does God decide everything that you're going to do in advance? It's one of those classical religious questions that come up always. Uh, Muslims refer to it as the issue of God's power and decree, al qadawar al qadah The Quran repeatedly stresses the power of God to the extent that he's decided everything before creation and written it down in a book. So you have, um, you have this uh, text, for instance, the keys of the unseen are with him. No one knows them aside from him who knows what is on the land and in the sea, and no leaf falls without God knowing it, nor a single grain of the darkness of the earth, nothing, nothing verdant, and nothing withered that is not in the clear book. What that book is, by the way, is also subject to controversy. Is it the Quran? Is it a divine version of the Quran? Is it some special book that exists in heaven that doesn't exist on earth? Or the Quran is some sort of shadow of that book? There's a lot of argument about the book. But here you have a text that definitely says God knows absolutely everything, and if God knows everything, if he knows what you're going to do, then you don't have free will. But there are also uh, verses in the Quran that suggest that people do have free will. Um, so there are verses that say whoever wishes will believe and whoever wishes will deny, which clearly says, well, it's up to individual people. They make a choice about what to believe in life. Um, and obviously there are theological problems. If God decides what we do or what we say or what we believe or what we think, then we have a huge problem with judgment because that's a bit unfair that um, God would actually uh, actually would um, you know, judge you if he'd made you think something and knew what it was going to be that. So, so that's, uh, that's a little bit um, uh, up for grabs, you could say. And there was a lot of argument on that issue of uh, the, had God already decided everything or do humans have free will. Uh, there were two opposed positions classically in Islam. There were the Qadariya who were complete, believed in complete free will. And those, uh, their opponents who uh, uh, supported the idea of people being predestined and they sort of won in the end, but it's not such a big thing today, but there were big battles over that in the middle ages about uh, to what extent human beings had free will, and that there's still those arguments are still out there to some extent. Okay, so that's a quick quick survey of basic beliefs and principles in Islam, um, and I'm just going to see if there are any questions there that relate to this. Oh, uh, how does they see Jesus given absolute monotheism? He's not the Son of God. 
he's described as Rihala, the, the spirit or the breath of God. So he's a human being, absolutely human being, not divine, but a special human being. So, and shouldn't be worshipped because only God can be worshipped. So yeah, he's, he's sort of got an upgrade from humankind, but way below the divine. Uh, much of text C is re reminiscent of Natani Tokov. Yes, yes. Well, you know, judgment texts are, uh, you know, Christian ones are pretty similar too. Um, uh, you might be a right and left. Again, that's very, very common in, in, in um, all literatures worldwide, in front of you, uh, behind you, above you, below you, to your right, to your left. There are early Gaelic hymns that do exactly the same thing. So that's a fairly universal idea. Is there anything in the Quran that identifies Jews with the devil? No, can be absolutely sure about that. No, there is not. Okay, so let's go on to Islam in practice, what are called the five pillars of Islam. And for Jews who are used to the idea of 613 mitzvot, uh, Islam looks very simple. You know, there are five basic things you have to do. Uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a, a huge amount of uh, things you should do, but there are five basic duties uh, five uh, foundational things that every Muslim is obliged in. Uh, so I put a, a, a chart of them here and we'll discuss each one. So Shahada is witnessing. This is the declaration of God's unity and Muhammad's status as his prophet. Um, uh, we just said, yes, Islam has many, many prophets. All the prophets in the Bible, uh, you saw in that text we just looked at before, they're all considered prophets. But Muhammad is the, the, the seal of the prophets and the best prophet, if you like. He's sort of, you know, super prophet. Um, why is there a single focus on him? Because he comes with a new message and he founds a new, uh, they, but they don't see it so much as founding. We would see it as founding a new religion. I think Muslims would see it as renewing and purifying the original religion of mankind is the way they would understand it much more. So Shahanda witnessing, that's a, dec uh, as we said, declaration of God's unity. People do this in prayer every day. It's a bit like reciting Shema in some ways. Um, and the actual formal text called the Shahada is um, it reads, I bear witness that there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. So that's very much like the, Sh the Shema, it's this foundational text that, that people will say at particular occasions. And to convert to Islam, all you need to do is say that in Arabic with sincere intention in front of two Muslim witnesses and boom, you're a Muslim. No betting. Okay, that's all you have to do to convert. So conversion is a very, very simple affair. People refer to it as taking Shahada. So people will say, oh, so-and-so took Shahada in, I don't know, Montreal in 1959, meaning that they converted. Uh, again, going with this idea that Islam is a restoration and purification of the original monotheistic religion commanded by God, a lot of um, modern Muslims will refer to converts to Islam, not as converts, but as reverts. So you'll see that a lot in um, some discourse, you know, somebody is a revert. Uh, do women count as witnesses? I'm not absolutely sure in this context. Just don't know. Don't know. It'd be interesting to find out. Okay, so that's Shahada. The next one is Salat prayer, which we're going to talk about uh, in a more detail. So I'll leave it for the moment. Uh, there is formal prayer five times a day, and that applies equally to men and women. Women do not get out of prayer. Uh, zakat, which is charity, and that is 2.5% of your liquid assets to be given to the poor and needy. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Saum, or Tsum, which is fasting during Ramadan, dawn to dusk fast for the 30 or so days of Ramadan. Hajj, pilgrimage. Uh, pilgrimage to Mecca should be performed at least once in your life by both men and women. Quite egalitarian in its duties. Let's see how this plays out in practice. Um, let's start with prayer. Now that word Salat, uh, we actually know um, uh, th that word from Judaism, uh, if you've ever said, I hope you haven't for any uh, you know, bad reason, but if you've listened to Kaddish, uh, tzloton, that's the same as salat, prayers. So it's, it's a common Semitic root. And the formal prayers are salat, as we said, men and women both have to do them. Private extra prayers, sort of individual prayers, are um, known as dua. So you make dua or people refer to it in English and say, you know, I made dua for him. So dua is your optional prayers. It's the extra stuff you might do. You might do it at the end of salat. Uh, you have to quite time and sit there and do extra prayers if you wanted to. But dua you can do anywhere under any circumstances. Uh, it doesn't have to be in Arabic. And salat is, you know, shakrat min kamarif, that sort of informal prayer. 
Uh, as in Judaism, uh, you don't need a clergyman to lead you, anyone can lead prayers. Um, and unlike Judaism, there is no siddur because the prayers are modular and repeated and everyone learns them from very, very early on. They're always in Arabic and they're memorized. And so nobody needs a book. Plus there's quite a lot of moving around and you know, it'd be difficult to put your siddur down and have to get down on your hands and knees. So the combination of short um, repeated prayers and um, five times a day means that you know, if, you, if you're a practicing Muslim, you definitely know them off by heart. And if you're not a very practicing Muslim, you probably still know them because you probably learned them as a child. Uh, converts have to learn them, but they learn by just practicing them. So the leader of the prayers is usually a respected and pious member of the community who knows how to do the leading. Uh, there is some controversy about whether men can be led by women or even whether women can lead other women. There seems to be more support for the idea that women can lead all women congregations in prayer. And more recently in the 20th century, there have been uh, people who, uh, there, there've been instances where women have led mixed congregations in prayer, but it's still quite controversial. Uh, there's no really singing or music in a formal prayer. There's a basic Quranic chant. Uh, but it's not really, they don't regard it as musical or singing and that's just not done a prayer. It's not a part of prayer at all. Um, Muslims can pray anywhere as long as it's clean and quiet. A mosque is preferred if it's available, partly because it can be guaranteed to be clean and quiet. Uh, prayer rugs are used simply to uh, ensure that when you get down on the floor, you're in a clean place and you're not going to, uh, you know, kneel down or prostrate yourself on something dirty um, and as we said formal prayers are always in Arabic wherever you live well, again we can recognize that from Judaism uh, as in Judaism communal prayer is considered preferable to individual prayer uh, some it depends which prayer of the day it is some are said out loud some are said quietly in, in the interior but uh, they never but it shouldn't be too loud too soft when it is out loud and in, inner intention of focus is absolutely essential nobody talks during davening in islam absolutely nobody and i've, I've been present at a couple of uh, muslim services and i'm always struck by the way they just get themselves into the the the, the framework and there they are 150 percent in the prayer and no no um no uh, distraction at all. They seem to be instantly able to focus, most unlike Jews. Mind you, I have to say, their prayers are a lot shorter than ours, so that might have something to do with it. Uh, mosques are, they are special places, but again, much more like shuls. They're not really holy in the way a church is holy. Uh, it's called a masjid in Arabic, which means the place where you get down and prostrate. Uh, misgad in Hebrew, very close. Uh, they don't have to be buildings. Any clean space used regularly for prayer is a mosque of sorts. Um, if you've ever been to the Jerusalem Citadel, you might know as you walk over the little bridge into it, there is an open air mosque, an ancient open air mosque on the left. Uh, and architecturally, mosques are very varied. You only need a few things for a mosque. Number one, no images, hence a lot of calligraphic ornament, um, usually verses in the Quran. Number two, Outside the area where you pray, there must be a washing area, often in a courtyard. Uh, Muslims need to be in a state of tahara. It's the same word in Arabic as in Hebrew, a state of purity before they pray, handle the Quran or go on Hajj. And before prayer, they perform a washing ritual called wudu, which is washing your face, your arms up to the elbow and your feet. So you often see pictures of people with their shoes off and foot wash. Um, full ablution, not in a mikvah, but more like having a shower, uh, is called ghusl. And that's done on other occasions, that's done after sex, after giving birth, after having a seminal emission, after menstruation. So it's much more uh, bodily purification practices. Uh, shoes aren't worn in mosques because they are a source of impurity, a bit like the temple where you couldn't wear shoes in the temple either. And of course, Moshe taking off his shoes when he's at the burning bush. Uh, inside the mosque, the only two features you need really are the mihrab and the minbar. The mihrab is a marking off in the decorated niche that points the direction of Mecca, a bit like a Mizrach. And uh, that again is based on the Quran. Here's this verse uh, in the second chapter of the Quran, from wherever you go forth, turn your face in the direction of the sacred mosque, i.e. The, the grand mosque of Mecca, and wherever you are, turn your face in its direction. Um, okay. So the minbar is just a pulpit from which the Friday sermon is given and the, the Friday sermon is called the khutbah. It's usually on a text from the Quran. And again, that's, uh, that's the only time you really have a sermon in Islam. And uh, what happens in the mosque, people line up in straight lines facing the mihrab for prayer. 
women might be in a separate space behind the men or they might be in a balcony. An awful lot of mosques don't have space for women at all. And they did a recent survey in the UK. Uh, Britain has about 1,600 mosques and half of them don't have space for women. There are major campaigns by Muslim women to insist that they get allowed in as well. So it's quite a contentious issue in the Muslim community. Um, prayer times, these are the times. Uh, they're set really by the by what the sun is doing, so they vary around the year. Uh, you can look them up on websites and find out where is, you know, when is Fajr in London or when is when is Dhuhr in Toronto, etc. So Fajr is just out, uh, after dawn, Dhuhr just after noon, Asr afternoon midway between noon and sunset, Maghrib, which of course is the same as Ma'ariv, uh, is uh, just after sunset, and Isha is between the end of sunset and midnight. You might think five prayers, that's an awful lot, which it is, uh, but they're much shorter than ours just as well, really. Shiites have the same uh, uh, prayers exactly, but they do some combining. So they'll sometimes combine Dhuhr and Asr and Makhr and Isha, a bit like we do in Khamarev. Uh, they will sometimes combine those two. And the Salat starts with the Adhan, the call to prayer, which is what you hear wafting out of mosques. So these days, uh, it's more likely to be a recording than a person, depends where you are, but it's usually a recording nowadays. And it starts, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, God is most great, and that's repeated four times. Then, I testify there is no God but God, repeated twice. I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God, repeated twice. Come or come alive to the prayer, it's Hayya, which you can hear is like Chai, uh, repeated twice. Come alive to flourishing. God is most great, Allahu Akbar, twice, and then ending up, there, there is no God but God. So that is always said at the beginning of prayer, uh, and if it's not said outside from, uh, from a minaret, it's, uh, it's said inside. And the person who uh, says it is called the muadzin, which comes up as muezzin in English. Uh, again, traditionally it's from a tower, but uh, it doesn't have to be, and if, as I was saying, if you're, if you're just having an informal prayer inside, somebody would still say the other. So one person stands in front of the community as the imam, as the leader, even if there are only two people there. There is no concept of a minion. So you can still do public formal prayer as a group, even if there are only two of you. And prayer starts with each individual silently declaring their intention to engage in prayer, a bit like a kavanah, it's called niya, and that's done before any ritual act. Again, very like a kavanah. And salat itself, the formal prayers, consist of formal sequences of words and actions uh, done in a modular way. Uh, and each module, each set is called a rakat. So some of these prayers, and I honestly can't remember which is which, I think Zuhur is a longer one, it might have something like three or four rakat, and Fajr might have two rakat, but they, you basically do the same sequence several times. As we said, there are no prayer books at all. Um, if you want to learn the prayer, you ask somebody else. Uh, quite a lot of videos, I think I've put some, yes, I've put some on here. Um, so each rakat starts with the person standing, they recite the first chapter of the Quran, Al-Fatiha, which is very short, and then another passage that can be from anywhere at all in the Quran. It's very often that little chapter 112 that we saw about God's unity. And then there's a sequence of movements that go with the prayers. First, a deep bow, ruku, then full prostration, sujud, right on the floor. Then they sit back, prostrate again. And that's one rakat. And when you've done the full number of rakat, whether it's two or three or four, uh, then the person stays sitting and recites an extra prayer that's a bit like the Shahada against testifying to God's unity, and also a prayer that God bless Muhammad and his family, and that's when they add any personal prayers they want to, do a bit of dua, and they end with a blessing of peace called the Taslim, which is related to the word Shalom, uh, peace and divine blessings and mercy to you all, and they say that twice and they look to the right and to the left, very like what we do at the end of the Amida with Ose Shalom, very, very similar. And that's explained either as a blessing to all Muslims, or all humans, or maybe a blessing to the two angels, one at each side of uh, one at each shoulder, which again is reminiscent of some Jewish ideas about angels accompanying you home on Friday night. So Friday noon prayer is the big one, and that's the only one that is a required community prayer. The minimum, that does have a minimum, four to 40 people, and there's a lot of arguing about how many. Women don't count for that. Uh, they don't have to attend. And Friday noon prayer starts with the sermon, usually on the Quran. But Friday is not a day of rest like Shabbat. It's just Yom al-Jumat, the day of getting together. 
and doing uh, prayer. Uh, women don't usually pray the Salat prayers when they're menstruating, uh, nor do they go into mosques or recite or touch Qurans or fast in Ramadan, though they have to make up fast days. Again, that's been challenged by some people um, much more recently, saying that this is a custom, it's not actually part of Islamic law, and you can't find any trace of it in the Quran, which is true. It doesn't, the Quran doesn't say anything about that at all. Um, and I've put a couple of um, videos there uh, so you can have a little look because descriptions aren't as good as actually watching it. So a couple of uh, videos, there are lots of teaching videos about Salat. Um, I, I sort of chose something that's short and, and seemed not too complicated. Okay, so let's um, move on to Zakat, the giving of charity. Uh, might be from the same root as Zuchut um, in Hebrews or the merit. Uh, there is a different word, sadaka, which I don't have to tell you what that sounds like for optional and charitable give it, giving. So in England, there's a sadaka day, on, uh, which is actually based on mitzvah day that's been um, started up by the Muslim community here. Uh, so it's always considered to be meritorious to give charity. Uh, zakat is, is an obligation. It's considered as purifying your wealth. And it isn't payable on fixed assets like machinery, if you have a factory or something like that but on liquid assets, and it should be given to the poor, travelers, God's cause, that means any religious purpose you like. And the rate is set 2.5% once your wealth reaches a set amount, and that set amount is 85 grams of gold, and I just looked up to see what that's worth, and it turns out it's about 5,000 American dollars at the moment. So once you have that amount of resources, you are liable to pay zakat, and there are any amount of zakat calculators on the internet where you pump in your income and your this and your that, no expenses, what have you, and it will calculate how much zakat you have to give. I presume it was easier in the old days. You didn't actually do that, you just estimated it roughly. Or maybe you went and asked your local scholar. Uh, we'll move on to the fasting, the psalm, or, which is clearly related to the root psalm in Hebrew. Uh, so it's a daylight, a dawn to dusk fast for the whole of the month of Ramadan. Uh, again, very like our minor fasts, you know, from when it's light in the sky to when it's dark. Uh, also, in the period you're fasting, you can't smoke, have sex, chew gum, or take medicine orally. You can have injections, apparently. If you eat by mistake, or if you eat because you can't fast, if you're pregnant, uh, if you're menstruating, if you've just given birth, if you're traveling, you add on days at the end to make up those days, which, again, we don't have in Judaism. If you miss a fast, you miss a fast. That's it. Okay. Um, and then we have, um, yes, again, if you simply can't fast for medical reasons, you can pay for 60 meals for the hungry. And that's known as kapara, which is clearly kapara, atonement. Uh, the fast is usually broken after sunset with a big family meal. It's a very happy time. Um, all over the Islamic world, there are special TV series for Ramadan. People look forward to it because big family, family time, special food, sweets, dates. Uh, dates are a very Ramadan thing. And it's also a season of spiritual intensity. It's a bit like the high holy days for us. Uh, people are supposed to recite the entire Quran during the month, or, and uh, many Muslims will recite one section a day. And there are traditional uh, divisions of the Quran into uh, 30 chunks for this very purpose. And the last 10 days are particularly sacred, and one of them is the Laylat al Qadr, the Night of Power. And according to tradition, though not the Quran itself, that's the night the Quran was brought down from heaven to be passed to Muhammad. Um, let's move on to the Hajj, the pilgrimage. Um, oh, wait a minute, let's just read the uh, Quran quote here for the basis of Ramadan. Um, Ramadan is the month in which was sent down the Quran as a guide to mankind. Again, it doesn't imply that it was all at one time, maybe it's during Ramadan. Also clear signs for guidance and judgment between right and wrong. So every one of you who is present at his home during that month should spend it in fasting. But if anyone is ill or on a journey, the prescribed period should be made up by days later. A little bit like Pesach Sheni, actually. Uh, but apart from Pesach Sheni, we don't have these, uh, we don't really have these, do it a bit later if you can't do it on the day. Um, so we'll move on to Hajj, the, the, uh, the pilgrimage. And Hajj, uh, maybe related to the word Hag, which itself is related to a circle, Hug. Uh, so the, the going round and round the Kaaba during Hajj may be, uh, may be linked to that idea. All Muslims are required to go on Hajj to Mecca once at least in their lifetime during the right Hajj season. And it's the 8th to the 12th day of 
the month called Dhul al Hijjah, the, 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 Hijj, the Hajj month. So there's a particular time when you can go on Hajj. You can go on optional pilgrimages the rest of the year, but it's, you're not fulfilling that particular religious duty. Uh, you only have to go on Hajj if you are physically able to go and financially able. And there are people who save up their entire lives to be allowed to go. And it is the great spiritual height of somebody's life to go to Mecca. Most of the ritual actually comes from well before Islam, but it was given a spiritual Muslim meaning. So, it's, so whatever it came from originally, it's now got layers and layers of, 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 of very significant spiritual meaning. Um, a lot of the actual rituals don't come from the Quran so much as from the Hadith, from the oral traditions. Uh, but there is this basic command, and here we can see it in the Quran. The first house of worship appointed for men was that at Baqa, which is the same as Maka. I don't know why it has a B, but it does. Full of blessing and of guidance for all kinds of beings. In it are signs manifest, the station of Abraham. You remember that Muslims believe that Abraham and uh, Ismail, uh, Ishmael actually uh, constructed the cover. Whoever enters it attains security. Pilgrimage thereto is a duty men owe to God, those who can afford the journey. And I've put a little video here that you might want to look at, which has some of the different rituals of Hajj. Um, so roughly, um, I'll just give you a sort of very rough introduction to Hajj, because you could do a whole session on Hajj. Um, so Saudi Arabia administers and controls the Hajj, and they allow about 2 million pilgrims in a year, and there are quotas for individual countries. You have to apply you have to be sponsored by your local mosque who says you're a proper Muslim, um, you know, you're, you're, you're from and you're worthy of doing Hajj. And then there are applications, and of course, some people get refused every year. Pilgrims have to be in a state of ritual purity. Uh, the men all wear two simple white cloths, one around the, the middle, one over their shoulder. Women can wear what they like, but they cannot cover their faces, which is fascinating because, uh, you know, the, our sort of popular stereotype is very, very pious Muslim women wearing niqab and covering their faces. You can't wear niqab on Hajj. You're not allowed to. That's absolutely not allowed. And there are long and complicated rituals. So basically, before the whole thing really kicks off as the, as the sort of in the, the starting off ritual, everyone walks around the Kaaba seven times, counterclockwise, reciting special prayers. And after that, they drink water from the Zamzam well. And that's thought to be the well the angel Gabriel showed Hagar when she was in the desert. They have the same story as we do of uh, Hagar wandering in the desert, looking for water with, with Ishmael, etc. So a lot of the Hajj rituals are based on that. Then the pilgrims, after they drunk from the well of Zamzam, they go off to the place of running. And there they move between two low hills, Safa and Marwa, seven times. And there they are imitating Hagar looking for water. Uh, in the old days, people did actually run or walk between the two hills. Nowadays, Saudi Arabia has constructed a system of electrified or electronic you know, walkways. You can just stand on them, they carry you backwards and forwards. It's all been very industrialized. Uh, a lot of Muslims are very sad about that, actually. Uh, then uh, men's hair is ritually shaved, a small lock of hair is taken off for women. The next day they travel about five miles away to a place called Arafah and spend the night there in a tent city. And the next day is the sort of peak of Hajj. There's what's called the standing ritual at Arafah and that lasts from noon to sunset. And this is seen as a rehearsal of Judgment Day, a time of introspection and prayer, and the essence of the Hajj. There's usually a sermon and then people just stand there and they pray and they chant Labaika Allah Labaika, which means I am here, God, I am here. And there are quite a lot of very moving uh, uh, YouTubes of people who are clearly having the absolute spiritual peak of their entire existence, standing there in the presence of God and uh, just reaching out uh, to, to the divine. Uh, and after sunset, they move off to another place, Al Muzdalifa, and they pray there and they collect pebbles for the next day's ritual. So the next day, there's another standing of the ritual in the morning, and then there are three stone pillars at which stones are thrown. The three stone pillars represent the devil, uh, and it's in memory of a hadith about Abraham, who is said to have cast stones at Satan, at Shaitan, uh, who tried to stop him from sacrificing his son at the Akedah. Uh, and it also represents every individual person's struggle with the forces of evil. And the stoning is the end of the official Hajj, but there are some rituals after that that everyone does. Uh, they sacrifice an animal, a goat, a sheep, or cow, a camel, and donate the money, the, the meat to the poor. Uh, this, is, uh, this happens on Eid al-Adha, the feast of the sacrifice, so Muslims around the world are celebrating with them. 
Uh, male pilgrim's heads are shaved again and again a lot cut of women's hair. Most of the restrictions are removed because you can't have sex during Hajj, for instance. Uh, that one still goes on. Uh, you can't smoke during Hajj, all sorts of things you can't do during Hajj. Certainly not to say gossip or horrible or fight. Uh, you can't fight during Hajj. Uh, and then they go back to the Kaaba and do another encirclement seven times round. And then the, the rest of the time they're there, they do sort of minor rituals like going off to Medina to visit the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad and, uh, and sort of various traditional things like that. But the essence is the, um, is the going around the Kaaba, the running back and forth and drinking from Zamzam, the uh, standing ritual at Arafat, throwing the stones at the devil or the devil stone, and then the ending up with another circumambulation of the Kaaba. Okay, so uh, Islam is not rich in festivals, by the way. Ramadan and, Idal, uh, and um, Hajj with Eid al Adha are the main ones. Uh, Ramadan ends with Eid al Fitr, which is the sort of festival that is, marks the end of Ramadan. And there are a couple of minor ones. Uh, we mentioned Laylat al Qadr, the night of power, uh, which is towards the end of Ramadan, the night when the Quran is thought to be sent down. Uh, Maulid, which is Muhammad's birthday. Not every Muslim country observes that. They don't in Saudi Arabia. They say it's you know, too idolatrous. You shouldn't be worshipping Muhammad. Not that it is worshipping Muhammad, but uh, some of the more puritanical uh, Islamic cultures reject that. Um, there is uh, Laylat al Miraj wal Isra, the 27th of the month Rajab, which is, commemorates uh, Muhammad's uh, supposed journey. Uh, up to heaven and back again. There is a new year, Rasa Sana, yeah, Rosh Hashanah. There's not really a festival. And Friday is a special day because Adam was created that day. It's not really a Sabbath, it's a day of uh, gathering. Yom al Juma is a day of gathering. It's not seen as sacrosanct in the way Shabbat is. It's not that narrative there at all. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick whiz through the questions here and then we'll go on to current landscapes. Um, no witnesses for conversion, male or female witnesses. I'm not absolutely sure. Can you renounce Islam if born or converted into it? Um, not a good idea because some countries, uh, there is a death penalty for apostasy from Islam. Um, it would depend where you were, which society you were. If you do it in London, nothing's gonna happen to you. If you do it in the middle of Saudi Arabia, I'm not a good idea. If those are the five pillars, where do Halal and circumcision come in. Circumcision is 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 not it's not like for us it's a mitzvah. For Muslims it's a it's a good practice because uh, Muhammad is said to have been circumcised, so that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, and it's uh, culturally it's very very ingrained in Muslim societies. Usually done about the age of twelve or thirteen. There's no specific age for it. But technically, I think you could be Muslim without being circumcised, as far as I know. Um, halal. The rules about food. Well, again the um, there are rules about food and they do appear in the Quran, but it's not a pillar of Islam. Um, and again, there's more latitude than in Kashrut. The, the Quran sort of says, well, you know, if, if you're having difficulties, then um, you know you should slaughter it. But if you can't, then just sort of say the name of God over it. Don't eat anything idolatrous. It's a bit more laid back. And there are quarrels about what you can and what you can't eat. So one of the traditional um, uh, schools of law says you can't eat shellfish, but all the other ones say you can. Um, pig, everyone very off pig. Intermarriage differences, men and women, if any, yes, Muslim men are allowed to marry women from other religions without them converting. Muslim women are not allowed to marry women from uh, men from other religions. Anyone can, oh, we talked about uh, people uh, leading prayers. Well, women is a bit more controversial. There are all women mosques, for instance, in China, there have been for hundreds of years, all women mosques. Um, Canada got its first in 2019. The States got one in 2015. So all women mosques are quite a modern thing also in the West. Um, and I think there might be even one in India. That's a bit of a trend. But China, they are deeply, deeply traditional. Uh, mixed congregations, that's very controversial, but it has happened here and there. Uh, in the Islamic call for prayer in countries or religions where they are a minority, are all three verses called, it's more than three. Um, depends where you are. So I, I certainly haven't heard the Adhan in London. I imagine they might sort of just do it internally. Uh, or the low volume, I don't know. I have been to Regent's Park Mosque and I can't, I don't think it was done outside. They're probably subject to, you know, local um, things about noise regulation in public. So I imagine they're quite adaptable. Uh, the part Rasul Allah means God's messenger rather than prophet. Yeah, um, yeah, 
prophet, yeah. No messenger, yeah. No prayer books, so the question of transliteration, bilingualism doesn't come up. Times of prayer change with the seasons, yes. Didn't Mos uh, Maimonides pray at a quorum of Muslim group prayer? I have no idea. Is it correct that early mosques didn't face Mecca? Yes, uh, there, uh, it seems that originally uh, people prayed facing Jerusalem and then Muhammad changed that. I think we talked about that in the first in the first session, possibly as a result of Jews not signing up to follow him. Uh, in hotels in Islamic countries, there's usually an hour in the room for prayer direction, indeed. Uh, so the whole family doesn't sleep during the night. Well, um, it depends. And of course, um, the Islamic calendar is lunar. And they don't call in Ramadan is in the summer, it's murder for everyone because you're fasting a terribly long time, uh, especially if you're in the, you know, the northern hemisphere. Uh, and if you're in the you know more near the equator, then it's roughly the same all around the year. But it, it depends, you know, again, we know this from our minor fast. Can the community sell or repurpose a mosque? Um, I don't know the details about that. I have no idea. They sell radios with alarm clocks of prayer. Yes. Uh, it's airport in Islamic country with common bathrooms. Yes, you'll see them in mosques anywhere you go, um, where you can do wudu. Yeah. How often to give charity? Well, uh, zakat has to be given once a year, uh, but you can give sadaka all the time, which is a good thing. How did they arrive at 2.5%? I have no idea. It'll probably be based on something in the Quran. Uh, prioritization of, of giving? I don't know. Um, I really don't know. There may be texts a bit like Maimonides uh, sort of ranking of who you give to first. Are there restrictions on watching television? No, nope, none at all. No, no restrictions on using electricity or watching television. No, no concept of Shabbat or Kag restrictions. Um, are there equivalent to charity collectors? I have no idea. I should imagine that depends where you are. Can women give charity with family finances? Yes, I think women can uh, own their own property uh, legally in Islam. Um, yes, we'll talk about that. Uh, what's considered an all accepted law is it by traditions? Well, it's not quite the same as, as Judaism. Uh, we are going to do a whole session on Islamic law and hopefully be a bit clearer then. Um, the Quran is the absolute basis, but there's a whole science of hadith and which ones are reliable and which aren't reliable, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's very complicated. Um, oh, and we talked about the many prophets. How do you respond to Muslims who are trying to convert you into Islam? Nobody's ever tried doing it yet. Um, so I have a response, I would probably say, but your own Quran says that people who respect God and uh, know he is one are fine. Um, it's not absolutely clear that Muslim in the Quran means Muslims or means people who submit to God of any religion. So there, there are interpretations like that, particularly among um, liberal Muslims now. So we're going to move on to today's landscape, which I should probably have to whiz through. I've based this very much on an excellent article, which is somewhere on the web uh, by Abdullah Saeed. I've written it here on the handout. Um, I've rearranged the order of some of these groups. I've simplified it down a bit because I think there's a whacking great article about 20 pages long, but I found it most useful, really helpful. And ever since I read that article, I have much more idea where to place particular people or groups or incidents that are happening go, oh yes, that'll be because they're whatever. So I found this very, very helpful because, uh, you know, this is a huge, huge uh, amount of people and cultures we're talking about, it's vast. Um, and of course they're not all the same. I mean, Jews aren't all the same, there's far fewer of us. So I'm sure you understand that. So again, these are not formal groups. These are clusters that, uh, um, as I say, I'm relying on Abdullah Saeed, um, where you can sort of say, well, these sort of organizations or people group together and their common characteristics are. Okay, so he starts, oh, well, he doesn't start off, I've started off with legalist traditionalists. So who are they? Those are sort of traditional scholars, the ulama, uh, ones who are professionals, uh, full-time employed, running courts. They're very concerned with preserving the traditional fourth schools of law which we'll talk about later in the legal session. Um, and they run madrasas and they run uh, traditional colleges, madrasas a bit like yeshiva. Uh, they emphasize taklid, which is the, the sort of legal strategy where you do what has been done before, like case law, you find something like it and go, okay, it's like that, we match up the pattern. And 
they tend to reject the opposite of that, which is independent legal reasoning leading possibly to new conclusions by informed scholars, um, which is called Ijtihad. Uh, and they're very anti-changing anything at all or reforming anything at all. It's very much tradition, tradition. Uh, and before you say that sounds really like maybe the Haredi end of the Jewish spectrum, uh, actually the Haredi end of the Jewish spectrum does a lot of Ijtihad, it does a lot of independent legal reasoning. So this is much more following what we've got before and not coming up with new things. If you look, for instance, at a lot of um, uh, you know, Haredi discussion of things like artificial insemination and um, modern medical techniques, it's remarkably creative. And I think this is more of a problem for people in this category in the Islamic world. Uh, they also very much favor putting classical areas of Islamic law, like family law and inheritance law into practice, but they don't generally want political upheaval or rebellion. They often uh, are quite happy with whatever government is in place. And they're often quite anti some of the Islamist groups, which are much more political and much more revolutionary. So it's much more, uh, you know, we'd like, um, we'd like our system in place, but we're, we're not going to lead a revolution to do it. They are often pointed by political establishments and supported. So a classic example is the Ulamada scholars at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, I mentioned last time they're actually uh, government paid bureaucrats. Uh, and then one name that you may have come across is Yusuf al Dawi, who is now in Qatar, but he's very much from this sort of group. So that's group one. Group two, political Islamists. We talk about them quite a bit last time. Uh, groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Jamati Islami in Pakistan, Hezbollah Tahrir, which is in Britain, uh, the political wings of Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, note Hamas is Sunni, uh, Hezbollah is Shia. So these groups exist both in the Sunni and the, uh, the uh, Shi'i parts of the Muslim world. Uh, they want to go back to the authentic Islam of the Prophet. Of course, you know, what, what's authentic is very much in the eye of the beholder. Uh, they reject any adaptation to different historical circumstances. Uh, they see Islam as monolith monolithic and never changing, and they're not interested in different versions of Islam. For instance, Chinese Islam is quite different in many ways from many other places. Indonesian Islam is also has its own character. They don't want to know about that. They, uh, they're very suspicious of cultural Islam or, or any local influence. Uh, they want Islamic states governed exclusively by, by Islamic law uh, that would enforce Islamic practice. Uh, so again, Iran is an example of this. Uh, they claim that Islam is totally independent of Western thought and philosophy. They sometimes claim that the West got all its technology and philosophy from earlier Islamic science or that it's been seen in the Quran, a bit like people sort of saying, well, you can see big the Big Bang Theory in Brazil. Um, they, however, they do employ a lot of Western concepts like nation states, democracy, human rights, the people. So those aren't traditional Islamic concepts, but a lot of political Islamists do use those concepts. Uh, they tend to regard the West as a monolithic thing that wants to uh, blot out Islam. Uh, they're very much opposed to mysticism and the Sufi tradition uh, on both theological and political grounds, so they tend to suppress them if they can. Uh, they're pretty conservative about women, uh, and that's often contrasted. Uh, they'll say, well, you know, the West has turned women into sex objects, and we are the people who really respect women, that's why they should you know, cover up. Uh, they certainly approve of polygamy. I don't know they necessarily encourage it. Um, they would quite happily uh, have restrictions on women's mobility and occupations. But many of their ideas about the family are actually much more Western than Islamic. So they tend to think about families as you know, small nuclear families rather than the huge extended families that were traditional in Muslim society. Um, and their attitudes to violence varies from disapproval to support. Some of them do support the violent overthrow of non-Islamist regimes, others don't, some shade off into militant extremists, our next group will have an armed wing, which is militant, uh, but generally the big mass movements in this group don't espouse violence. Um, they, they do see themselves as ruling the future Islamic state, sometimes they've made plans, but sometimes they haven't. Um, but that's a little bit different from our next group, the militant extremists. Uh, the mentioned extremists are people like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, the armed wing of Hamas, the armed wing of Hezbollah, uh, the Islamic Jihad, things like that. The emphasis is very much on attacking the West, but increasingly they are attacking other Muslims who they don't agree with. Uh, they tend to be small and secretive networks. They don't usually have mass support. 
Uh, they're motivated by a deep sense of injustice and feeling of powerlessness. They often use the crusades as a symbol, and you know, they rather the West is trying to crusade against us today. They're convinced the West wants to wipe out Islam. And uh, we mentioned this last time, one of their novel interpretations is they see jihad, uh, armed jihad as a duty of every Muslim individual rather than as, as a communal duty, which it was classically. They often talk about bringing back a caliphate and a worldwide Islamic state. Uh, they're very uninterested in developing workable plans for future Islamic state. The idea basically is, um, you know, there will be an apocalypse and God will sort that out, but we don't have to. We just have to do the fighting and wham, it'll come in, it'll be perfect. They don't actually do a lot of planning there. And they often regard Muslims who don't share their ideas as kuffar, as infidels, and therefore open to attack. So for groups two and three, both the political Islamists and the militant extremists, um, again, that Gallup poll I told you about, which I think I put a link in here, um, has estimated maybe 7% of Muslims worldwide support those groups. They're not majority groups, but they're worrying uh, because they have a huge potential to spread mass communications, uh, failure of Marxism, nationalism, and secularism in many, many uh, regimes in the Muslim wor world, corruption of many regimes in the Muslim world, and their failure to solve economic and other problems. So that certainly makes people discontented, much more likely to listen to this stuff. Uh, the conservatism and low quality of many of the traditional scholars in many countries, so people won't listen to them. Uh, the effect of urbanization on country people who are used to very much more traditional Islam. And of course, the strains of modernity adapting to change, economic, social, and what have you. So this all lays the ground for the adoption of these ideas. Uh, theological Puritans, so some of them are like the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia, but, but some of them are, don't like the Wahhabis and they're, sort of, they're, they're wider, you could say, they're a sort of more general movement. Uh, the Salafists are examples, also in India, the Deobandis and Tablighat Jamaat in Pakistan. So they oppose all what they call bid'a innovation and culture on the ground it's not authentic again they're back to the back to the authenticism thing uh, they're often very puritanical they insist on very strict gender separation they prefer women to wear niqab uh, they don't allow music dancing clapping i actually fell foul of this once i was uh, with omani muslims and uh, we were playing a, a sort of nice interfaith game and it involved clapping and suddenly all the omanis go and sit down and go what's wrong and nobody knew they didn't go they didn't believe in clapping uh they're okay with polygamy uh, a huge emphasis on correct belief and a lot of, you know, this is the only way you can believe this, uh, so it's very creedal in basis. Um, it's often in the West linked to an identity quest among young Muslims who don't want the culture-based Islam of their parents, which is very traditional and organic and it's what we did in the village back home and they can't sustain that sort of identity and they're looking for a pure and authentic Islam that's sort of divorced from its cultural context. Um, then we have, uh, this is the liberal group for progressive ijtihadis, and that's, it would include Muslim, um, modernists, liberals, feminists, and reform-minded traditionalists. Many based in the West, but sometimes, uh, you know, so people can let them uh, speak freely for a start. Um, groups like the Muslim Canadian Congress, uh, Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan, I imagine that's not functioning at the moment, uh, the British Progressive Muslims, Muslims for progressive values, all sorts of uh, various smallish, usually movements like this. Uh, they uh, advocate a lot of reform of many areas of Islamic law. They're usually against polygamy, for instance. Um, they support this idea of ijtihad, the idea of the independent reasoning of a legal scholar is what you follow, not just precedent. You go to a scholar who knows what he's doing. He looks for all the sources. He sorts out the right answer for your context, uh, which is quite Jewish. Um, important figures, you may have heard of some of these, Amina Wadud, very famous American Muslim, Khalid Abu al-Fadl, written a huge amount, uh, in Britain, Ziauddin uh, Sadar. Uh, so they write, a lot of these people write a great deal, uh, publish a great deal, uh, can be found on YouTube doing lectures. Uh, and many of them combine traditional Islamic scholarship with Western thought and education. Quite a lot of them teach in universities. Uh, they uh, insist that social change should be reflected in Islamic law, and um, they emphasize social justice, gender justice, human rights, harmonious relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. So if you're a, in an interfaith context, you may very well be talking to people from this group. The majority of Muslims in the world, however, are probably cultural Muslims, like, like Jews who are just Jewish. 
uh, they learn from their families and societies and they do what they've seen growing up. They're traditional. They don't have very conscious ideology. They may have very low amount of, Jew uh, of, of Islamic education. You know, they just do what grandma did or mum did or what have you. The level of what they actually do may vary absolutely enormously. A lot of Turkish Muslims who would think of themselves as Muslims drink alcohol, for instance, uh, but they still feel very Muslim. Like Jews who aren't particularly from often still feel very, very Jewish. So it's very part of their identity. And they are often alarmed by or opposed to the more ideological and violent versions of Islam that we've been talking about before. And our last group is the secular liberals who regard Islam as a matter of private personal belief, rather like mirroring the Western idea that religion's your affair, but I don't want it in my public space. Uh, they are always against Islamic states and the position of Islamic law. And uh, they favor individual freedom, democracy, freedom of speech, gender equality, religious freedom. They will often uh, speak out against Islamic infractions of these. Uh, and they're often very controversial figures. They're often ex-Muslims too. So the secular liberals, people like Ayan Hirsi Ali, Ibn Warak, which is a pen name, Irshid Manji, we talked about those before. So that's a really, really quick sketch. And I will go back and have a look at the questions. How does the conservative Muslim law adapt to modernization and technology? Very like Jewish law, actually. Uh, we'll talk to that more when we talk about uh, Islamic law. Please elaborate on, oh, I can't elaborate on Chinese Islam and Indonesian. <laughs> they are very different. Uh, they are mainstream Islam, but, but um, traditional Islamic countries are, are different in every country. They, they're a bit like, you know, Moroccan Jews are very different from Iraqi Jews and they're different from Ashkenazim. Uh, so uh, Chinese Islam had its own particular things, uh, as we said, women's mosques, for instance. Indonesia has a tradition of women Quran reciters, which is unusual in the Islamic world. Um, so again, it, you really would need, you, you need a session on each to, to pull out the, the differences. How are LGBTQ issues treat in Islam? Well, if you are anyone but a progressive ijtihadi or a secular liberal, you are probably not very for it. Um, and the, the more extreme the group, you know, if you get back to theological Puritans, it's all forbidden, forbidden, forbidden. Um, not so different in the Jewish world. Uh, which of the two classes of Islam? It's not classes really. Uh, Sunni and Shia are two different um, aspects of Islam really. I, don't, I wouldn't call them um, classes. I think, well, you can't generalize. There are Sunnis who are you know, ISIS is Sunni, uh, but so is um, Khaled Abu al Fadl, a very progressive uh, person. Um, you know, the, the, the government of Iran is Shia, but then there are also progressive Shiites. Uh, so it depends. You'd have to sort of, they're too big to characterize in that way. You'd have to look at individual groups and particular people. Um, it's a bit like saying, Arashkenazi Mosfardim more progressive or something, you would say, well, I don't know, which Ashkenazim are you talking about? Uh, what percent of the progressive Ijtihadis? Don't know, no idea. A, a, a smallish group. Um, they're mostly very highly educated. Certainly the leaders are very, very highly educated. Uh, but they do have quite wide followings. Um, I would say increasingly wide followings. There are a lot of people who follow people like Khaled Abu al Fadl, who's uh, head of something called the Usuli Institute, which is somewhere in America, I can't where, remember where. Um, and yeah, they speak to a lot of Western Muslims in particular, but not just Western Muslims. Uh, Crusaders represent Western aggression, yep. What about Muslim aggression where they conquer to be part of the world? Well, you know, it's always different when, when you're on the receiving end or if you're on the giving end. That's just true of human beings. Um, right, I think that's the end of the chat questions. Any any last questions? I don't know if anyone wants to. Uh, uh, just one comment. Sure. I, uh, I have a friend who was recently in Albania and he met with the Baba Mandi, who's the head of the Bakteshi group of Sufi Muslims. Uh, they believe in peace and coexistence and supposedly have several million uh, followers, including um, many who live in Albania. And he said that he was very nice and gave him a blessing and wants peace with, wants Israel to be able to live in peace. Yeah, the Sufis, we, we're going to do a whole session on Sufism. Sufism is all over the Muslim world. It's very repressed in places like Saudi Arabia and also I think in Iran. 
but um, Sufism is, partic is very, very attractive to millions of Muslims worldwide, and it does tend to be quite laid back. Not always. There were Sufi orders in North Africa who fought against the French, but again, you know, they were resisting invasion, so fair enough, I suppose. Uh, so you can't say they're all peaceful. And again, it would depend when and where. But many, many um, prominent Sufis are in the sort of progressive Ijtihadi sort of side of things. Um, and uh, very conscious of the oneness of humankind and the oneness of God and, you know, the tend to to see similarities and onenesses rather than divisions and differences. So we'll do a bit more about Sufis when we get to that session. Um, somebody said, would the Muslim reluctance to plan for a future Muslim state expect, explain the Taliban in Afghanistan's lack of planning? Um, I don't know. Uh, they're, they're extremist, uh, you know, they're ex uh, militant extremists, the Taliban, um, probably combined with sort of theological Puritans. Uh, well, I, I, the mess in Afghanistan is not just a Taliban lack of planning. It's also there's been a terrible drought for several years. So, you know, with or without the Taliban, they'd be having a major, major crisis anyway. It just makes it all much worse. Uh, I don't know how much um, planning the Taliban have done. So, again, I find that one a bit difficult to answer, really. Uh, it may be an element. I, I just I'm not very familiar with the ideology and, uh, and uh, theory of the Taliban. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sorry, I can't, I can't tell you much more on that one. Uh, any last ones? You okay? Fantastic. I think we're, I think we're there. How did the odd, so I've got the odd number 2.5? I have no that you, you probably have to trace that back to a hadith or something in the Quran. I, I honestly don't know where the 2.5 comes from. How well a Jewish fundamentalist prepared to run a real government. Very good point. Uh, you know, um, um, you know, people want, uh, there have been suggestions, you know, there, there are people who aspire to a halachic theocratic state ruled by rabbis. Um, but, you know, there, there, there would be problems with that because halakha doesn't cover absolutely everything. Or, or are you just going to say, well, I don't know, the drains, that's nothing, you know, sanitation systems, that's not to halakha. In which case, so, you know, where are you going to get your, your planning for that from? So uh, it is a good question. Um, yeah. Uh, fundamentalists of any religion, uh, often it's it's all sort of based on God will come down and make it all clear, but it's a little bit different when you get there. And sometimes they have to, um, sometimes they have to compromise. Uh, Iran's quite an interesting example because uh, in places they compromise, in places they didn't compromise. In places, by the way, the, um, the, the Shia have quite a tradition of women scholars. Uh, so there are some licensed female, not quite Ayatollahs, but there are some, uh, there are some prominent female scholars in Iran who have quite a following and uh, are quite highly respected. Shiism is, um, certainly Iranian Shiism, uh, has been quite progressive on women, not completely, depends what, but uh, not perhaps as repressive as the Wahhabi idea of women just stay at home shut up. Um, so yeah, it, it varies enormously. And, um, you know, in a, in a course like this, this is very much a general introduction, uh, but the situation on the ground in a specific place at a specific time is always particular and it always will have surprising features and things don't quite fit into the general pi uh, picture so um, again it's always worth saying okay well what's the place and the time I want to find out about and let me look at something on that because um, that may not chime at all with what's happening at a different time in a different place in an Islamic uh, society okay so I think we're done fantastic see you next week I can't remember what we're doing next week but it's on the app <laughs> So see you then. Might be the Quran okay. session, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for uh, sticking around and uh, looking forward to next.